And I put together a slideshow of successful bird conservation stories. And uh, so, and there's lots and lots of those, so it, it might be during the slideshow where I will go really fast for a bit because I put too much in the slideshow and you guys will want to go home tonight sometime. So we'll see how it works with that. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, there, I think that's better, I think. Yeah. Um, for those of you who don't know, <laughs> this is my daily picture. Some of you get it, if you don't, and if you want to get it, you're welcome to do so. Uh, it's a free picture. It goes out to about 3,000 people all over the world now. I have a lot of fun with it. Uh, I know some of you get it. If you don't, you're welcome to sign up for it. Well, let's not get distracted by just those things, so let's move on to the slideshow. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I gave this talk first to say the Rebels League, and uh, one person was here. <laughs> and so, that's, so she's going to get bored real quick. No. <laughs> but it's a, it's a fun story. And, you know, I'll start off with Audubon, you know, and the fact that uh, California, or the National Audubon Society was really established to save the egrets. I don't know if you all know why the egrets were being hunted to near extinction was for women's hats and women's clothes. And uh, this is a subject I'm going to come back to at the end of this talk, too, because it's pretty interesting that white feathers were very, very popular in New York and Paris and London and things like that, to the point where the egrets in the United States were almost hunted to extinction. And the egrets are just too pretty to hunt to extinction, you know. And these feathery feathers, like these that are actually called, it's a French word called aigrettes, uh, is how they get their name, uh, is what, you know, one of the things that make them really good. And here's a breeding great eager when they have this green face. They only have that for like two weeks a year. And it's pretty spectacular. Uh, and, and it's during the breeding season, you can tell, because this one's really a mess and it's got a green face. Uh, we like them because they eat gophers. Uh -huh. uh, and and in taking the egrets, you know, when Audubon got started, it, it was a lot for the great blue herons, too, even though the great blue herons weren't, their feathers weren't used as much as egret feathers were. Uh, when they went to hunt the egrets, they went to the big colonies where both herons and egrets all did together, and so it was bad for all of them. Um, and of course, they eat gophers too, so we like that. <laughs> and then some of the smaller egrets, like the snowy egret, was also used as a thing. And they're delightful birds. I mean, many of you probably know snowy egrets and their golden slippers, and uh, yeah, cool egrets, being not on gophers. But, uh, and they get a red face, and uh, their red face is actually only there for a few days, and only when they're displaying. It's a, uh, I guess it's probably they get the blood into it, so it's pretty cool to see. It's a real brief little thing, and I felt very lucky. Finally, I've never seen this before. I should tell you, these pictures were all taken in downtown Santa Rosa on 9th Street. Uh, somebody told me about this eager call. I was down on the sidewalk and getting these spectacular pictures. Really fun. Anyway, and the black ground night herons, and uh, you know, building the nest there too. And then down in the south, there were a lot of uh, egrets like this tri colored heron, or the reddish egret, or the little blue heron that were also pretty heavily impacted by these things. And uh, how many of you know drink to use Tabasco sauce? I strongly recommend using Tabasco sauce because the McElhaney Foundation, uh, long ago, they're the ones that actually built a big cage when there was no safe place for egrets to nest. They captured egrets and put them in this big cage and started them nesting there until the point where they got uh, lots and lots of egrets in this cage nesting. And then they just took the cage down and they are still nesting on every island in, uh, in New Iberia, Louisiana. And the best part is the Macaulay Foundation that gives like a million dollars a year to Louisiana State University for bird research. So that's why I. <laughs> Whoops! Oh, this guy complained because he was the last of the egrets. Oh, uh, Shelly. <laughs> now, the, uh, all everybody knows the brown pelican was an incredible uh, recovery story. Uh, if you go back, in, I took this picture in 1970, and when I used to give talks back then, I would say, you know, the brown pelican's on its way out. You know, it was the numbers are declining. We still don't know entirely why. Actually, in the 70s, we figured out that it was because of pesticides. And uh, actually, this is a very, very doppled picture, but that is, how many of you know the Sibley Guide to Birds? Well, this is Fred Sibley, Charles Sibley's father, in 1968, when he and I, and I was just a, a young student, uh, part-time for Fish and Game, they sent me out to help Fred, and what, we, what he did was uh, 
collect some pelicans, and the eggs that were underneath the female, and uh, numbered the pelicans and numbered the eggs. And so the, then this all went back into the lab, and he showed that the levels of pesticides in the pelican tissue were directly related to how thin the eggshells were. And so this was the thing, this was the study that realized that pesticides were not good for birds. Um, and uh, this was, there were three groups of people who went out and did this. I was one of them, and oh, this was one of the groups. Uh, and uh, with that revelation came, oh my gosh, you know, DDT is not good for the world. And it turns out that it was Monsanto Chemical Company dumping a lot of stuff into the LA River, the Los Angeles River, and that's why it affected the pelicans so heavily. Is because, and to this day, you can still test and get some results from that back in the 50s and 60s when they were dumping into the water. Luckily, it's low enough to it's not bothering the birds now. But now we've got pelicans everywhere, and it's a really great success story that the uh, you know, brown pelican is now off the endangered species list. And uh, you get to see lots of adults here with the immatures here. When I, my first job as a fish and game was to go through all the old Christmas bird camps and prove that pelican numbers were going down. And we realized they were going down. We didn't know why, but we started looking for young birds. And we never saw like, young birds because the eggs were always being crushed by the females. So here's three young birds just flying by there and more. Uh, of course, pelicans diving are really fun to see, and so we now get be entertained <laughs> by pelicans, and it's a really good success story that's come back. In fact, there's so many pelicans now, there's a paper going to be coming out in uh, a couple of months on uh, the status of the brown pelicans. It's a scientific paper, but there are so many pelicans now that they're doing things that we didn't ever expect them to do. Like, I took this picture in uh, early January in Northern California. That bird's in total breeding plumage. He should be in Ba, you know, with his wife, you know, doing something right <laughs> or whatever, you know. And, uh, but uh, they are staying up farther north than they used to, but probably because there's just so many of them now. It's probably not an ecological problem. It's probably a fact that we've got them back to a real level now, which is very exciting. But we better keep on it, because this guy's telling me to be careful. He's giving me this thing to make sure that we keep it good and successful. Of course, pesticides bothered a lot of other birds, too. You know, the raptors were a big part of it, the osprey here, and of course the fishing birds, because fish uh, gathered up a lot of pesticides in their bodies, and ospreys became very, very scarce on the West Coast for a number of decades. And during the 70s and 80s, they started coming back, and so now, I mean, osprey is a common bird. We see them all the time. They, you know, it's a really fun thing to have. And it's a spectacular bird to see. It's this incredible nest. I, 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 this is a sidelight. But on this nest three weeks ago, there were two Canada geese sitting on there. <laughs> and then the osprey migrated home and kicked the Canada geese out. Where is it? That's in Fort Bragg, in the harbor in Fort Bragg, actually. And the peregrine falcon, of course, was a really iconic thing for uh, the pesticides and the thin eggshells and, and stuff like that. And they almost went extinct in the United States. And uh, thanks to peregrine fund and uh, you know, stopping using pesticides, uh, they came back and the peregrine fund was introduced into a lot of places and, and really done some great things with them. Uh, in fact, we're excited right now because this peregrine here is probably the male of a pair that looks like it's going to nest about 12 miles south of our house. And uh, I don't know where this young one came, but uh, it's pretty exciting. This is a little greenhouse I built on our upper deck. And here's a pair of a young pair of the sitting on our upper deck. So we know they must be coming back. So <laughs> it's pretty exciting to see that bird there. Uh, and, you know, lots of other raptors, the prairie falcon uh, that's found in the, the, you know, in the desert, mostly throughout the drier country. Uh, the merlin, which is a migratory bird from the northern cows, uh, from the north, comes down here in the winter. Uh, they were, they're all recovering. Of course, the bald eagle is a bird that was heavily impacted and uh, is recovering dramatically. Uh, we get bald eagles nesting in places now that we haven't seen them in 50 years. It's very exciting. Uh, yeah, there's one eating that goes out of uh, eating the carp up here, <laughs> so they, they, they fish, you know that. And uh, now we can see young bald eagles around because they are reproductively uh, being successful again, which is really cool. And here's one young one that's it's not a great picture, but it's a fun story. 
I looked out the backyard, but I got home from the gallery one time, I, and all the dolls in the coat just went crazy. I couldn't figure out what was going on. And I said, man, they're acting like an eagle's around, but we don't get eagles here, so it must be something else. And then it happened again, and about the third time I went out and looked, and there was a bald eagle there. An immature bald eagle that was out, and it was eating baby gulls. So that's why the gulls were upset. <laughs> but it turned out that this bird, you see the red tags, was from the Channel Islands. It was one of the ones that had been, uh, uh, where the eggs had been taken out of uh, the nest and raised in captivity, and raised in a way that they didn't get attached to humans, and put back into the nest just before they fledged. And this bird had fledged just about two weeks prior to the fact that it was in our place for about a week. And uh, that's pretty cool. They're out, they're out. You know, this has been a successful thing. So, and then uh, nor uh, Northern Harriers, uh, red-tailed hawks, uh, and I mentioned these raptors because in California, uh, there's a guy up in the San Bernardino area, Ed Caldefino, who decided, well, I need to figure out where these hawks are, you know, and, and how many of them are in the valley. And it turns out the Central Valley of California is probably the best place to look at raptors in North America. There's a greater number and variety there than any other place, and he's showing that. And so it's really good to see all these raptors coming back. And one of them, which was just as a phenomenal story, this is the Swainson's hawk. The Swainson sock was once a very common bird throughout uh, the central part of the United States and all the way out to the west coast, uh, through the plains and the central valley and so on. And it, like, disappeared. Uh, when I was a young kid, if you saw a Swainson sock, you could put double underlines in your notes. You know, it was just a really, it became a very rare bird and almost entirely extirpated from the central valley. And the young fellow named Brian Woodbridge decided, well, man, that's wrong. You gotta figure out what's going on. So he started following everything he could about the swings of sock and he couldn't find anything going wrong with them in California. So he said, well, better go down to Argentina where they winter. So he uh, went down to Argentina and he uh, started interviewing people there. And it turns out that swings of socks, when they go down there, they get in huge flocks, hundreds of swings of socks together, and they work the fields for grasshoppers and things like that. So they're working in big fields. Well, it turns out these are agricultural fields and they were being um, hammered by pesticides and herbicides uh, a lot. And so he started an educational program uh, to kind of teach the local farmers, you know, about what their impacts were. And he got into the schools, so the kids learned about it. And it's incredible what has happened down there is that they no longer use pesticides or they, and use, or they use different kinds now that don't bother the birds. And so the Swainson's hawk has rebounded almost entirely so now, it's very common to see a flock of 25 to 30 strengths of socks in the Central Valley. And it's all thanks to Brian Woodward. So that's a, that's a pretty cool story. This guy's thanking Brian. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, sharp shin hawks and Cooper's hawks. There's a Cooper's hawk. Uh, these are the ones that come to your backyard feeders, you know, eat the birds that eat your feeders. You know? <laughs> that's uh, part of life, you know. <laughs> And it's good to see them back. But they're actually increasing in numbers to the point where um, we find Cooper stocks nesting in Sacramento now. We find them nesting here in Los Angeles, in suburban areas where there's enough trees. It's not unusual to find the sharp shin and Cooper stocks around now. They're really recovering. It's real fun to have them. White tailed kites, another story. And I don't know about, I can't tell you how this success story happened, but this is a fascinating one. Is that uh, in 1920, when there was a bird book titled uh, Birds of the Pacific States, written by, um, uh, sorry, blanking on his name. Uh, anyway, I'll remember for a second. But he said that there were 20 pairs of white tailed kites left in the United States. Um, and Ralph Hoffman, is Ralph Hoffman, who actually died out on the Santa Barbara Island, reaching out to try to collect a rare plant. <laughs> anyway, that was a long time ago. But anyway, he said there were 20 pair left in the United, in, in the United States. And, uh, then they started coming back to the point now where we have white tailed kites all over the place. And they're really very common bird and very spectacular. And they grow on big uh, roosts in the wintertime where you can see two, three hundred in the spot and stuff. Nobody did anything special to recover them. But they somehow did on their own. And I actually think that what happened was that prior in the old days, back in the 1800s, when people first came in to California uh, and converted all the marshes into agricultural fields, 
uh, these guys lived at the edge of marshes. And the marshes disappeared. So they didn't have any place to go. But their numbers got down real small. But then they kind of, I think, that there were a few of them that were sort of adapted to living in, in big open grassy fields. And well, we made lots of big open grassy fields in the Central Valley at the time. And their numbers started going back up. And I actually think that this white-tailed kite is a different form of bird than we had back in the 1800s when they specialized in something else. I think we saw a little, giant, little genetic bottleneck and a recovery from that. So I didn't think that. I don't know if it's true or not, but we got a lot of white-tailed kites now. It's fun. Now here's an interesting one. Uh, obviously you've all heard of the California condor. This is a picture of two condors flying in 1971 when there were only 15 of them left in the wild. And uh, they, uh, those are not tags. They're not tagged. They've never been touched by humans. Uh, they were wild. And then of course uh, in uh, the late 70s and early 80s they started capturing all the uh, condors and bringing them into captivity. I have to admit I was not a fan of that. I felt that that was uh, a lot of money that was going to be put into something that unless you could bring the mammoths back and the giant sloths, there weren't going to be enough food for a, a bird like the condor, and it's going to cost us a lot of money to keep them going. Well, it has cost us a lot of money, and, but here we are. They're back. This is number 51. Here's number 68. There's now like 600 condors, I think, in the wild. Uh, there's still, being, still a lot of money going into maintaining them. But the cool thing about it is, is that it is you know, a charismatic bird. People get behind the project and they understand conservation, bird conservation stories. And so uh, somebody the other day called it, well, it's a loss leader. You know, <laughs> and yeah, it costs us money to do that, but without it, you don't get the benefits on the side, you know. And uh, so now, you know, uh, many of you have probably heard of the issue on lead uh, poisoning because of lead ammunition. And that most of the condors uh, that are being introduced to die, die because of lead poisoning. And a lot of other raptors and, and stuff die. And the condor is the lead animal to say, hey, this is a problem we have to be thinking of. And so, yes, it's a loss leader, but it's, it's something that's bringing something to our uh, attention that we really know, need to know. Okay, I come from up north. <laughs> we got big trees up there. <laughs> and about, 3% of what used to be there are the big trees, you know, and so there are a lot of species like the marble girl that, that uh, used to nest in the old limbs and the tops of trees and they need big limbs because they lay their egg right on the limb and uh, well they, they kind of disappear and uh, these old trees that have these big limbs and weird stuff, you know, they're a lot less common now and it really made a difference. If you map the marble merle distribution along the coast from Washington down to Santa Cruz, uh, little patches where they still are are exactly where old growth forest is on land. And so, you know, we're going to restore the old growth forest thanks to Save the Rivers League. A big part of that, you know, it's only going to take us about one to two hundred years to do that. You know, so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and there are people saying that we won't be able to do it, but uh, we're actually in a, doing a lot more management now. We're actually thinning forests to hasten their ability to recover to old growth characteristics. And uh, we won't know if that's right for a couple hundred years, but uh, we are monitoring the birds now and uh, to see if we're making any stupid mistakes. It's kind of what we call a adaptive management. When you do something, you make sure that what you do is not doing bad things, then you do something else and you check it again and you kind of watch your way through here. But uh, up in Alaska, where there's a lot of old growth forests, uh, there's still quite a lot of marble marlots. You can see flocks of 300 of them together. But down here, where the, you, know, you see a tree like this, it's standing out. Because uh, it's the only big tree left in the forest, you know, and uh, there's not many marble marlins here. So we started to study a long time ago. I was real involved with this, um, and uh, where we uh, train people to survey for mon and monitor for marble marlins in the forest. And this is the kind of view you get of them and early in the morning when it's still dark and they're flying over. Mostly you get to listen to them. But uh, they look like trees during the green season because that's what they live on, these trees, you know. And the chicks, when they first are hatched, they have this down all over the back of them that makes it look like uh, the bark, and they fit in really well. And it's really cool, because when they go, the last, they actually will leave the downy feathers on the back, even though the new feathers will grow in. Most of the time when a bird molts, the feathers, the new feathers push the old feathers out. But when the 
marble gorilla is growing up as a chick, the, the downy feathers actually stay attached to the real feathers until it's time for them to fly away. And of course, they fly away because mom and dad don't come back and feed them anymore. And they just sit there on the branch in the middle of the forest and not even knowing what's going on. They've never been anywhere but on that branch. And they get out and they fly to the ocean and they learn how to be a seabird. I think that's pretty impressive. <laughs> but, uh, it's going to be a long ways, but the, the, the trend is in the right direction for the marble world is that we can restore these forests. So thanks, Sam Jones Lee and other groups like that that are doing that. Yes, ma'am. What's the name of that tree again? The, the tall ancient one. Was that a marble? Did you say? The great big tall one with the red one. Oh, the, the, those were all coastal redwood trees. Oh, but this had a particular form. Oh, uh, I, I don't know the name of it. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I've seen one. This is called a myrtle yeah, no, but yeah. Okay. So, and in the wintertime, you can see black and white, so that's what they look like when they're done with all the brown and stuff. Uh, but, you know, the interesting thing is, yeah, we're doing this because we're trying to save the myrtle it's locally, but there's more to conservation when you do it. Like, this is an old redwood tree that's been burned out, and it's a big, uh, huge, hollow tree. And, um, you know, we don't have as many of these anymore because they've got them all down. But, you know, when you find them, you find boxes of Swiss nesting in them. And boxes of Swiss are a bird that migrates down to South America and stuff. So the work that, say, the Rebels League is doing here to save the trees and to get, restore the stuff is going to help people down in South America enjoy the birds that migrate all the way down there. One of my things that I do nowadays, whenever I see one of these things, I take my little point and shoot with the flash on full and take a picture up in there. And I've actually I've actually found a bath in there, but that's something I have around there. I haven't found much, but someday I think I'm going to find something really exciting in one of these series. Okay, another one that I've worked on a lot and, uh, and you know, got a lot that's kind of close to my heart is the snowy plover. And the snowy plover is a bird that nests along the beach, and the ones from Washington down to Baja that nest within 50 miles of the ocean, you know, on the beach are uh, uh, listed on the endangered species list. They're threatened species. Uh, the biggest issue uh, is picture one on the beach. Uh, their biggest issue is uh, habitat destruction because of the introduction of the um, European beach grass that has completely taken over uh, the native habitat and made it so snowy plovers have to see a long ways away so that they know a predator is coming to go distract it before it gets to the nest. Uh, and uh, you can't see a long ways away, you can't really nest. And so we're trying to get rid of all the beach grass up to open the thing up and we're making some progress there. And the other one, of course, is the common raven, which uh, eats, loves snowy plover eggs. And uh, we, have, we, we feed so many ravens now, people are taking care of, that raven populations have probably tripled in the last 60 years. Uh, and, and those are a big deal. Yeah, they eat weird things. And they stick his head in, <laughs> little beach hopper. Uh, this is the, I call this plover with lunch. Yeah. They feed on Lots of different crustaceans that live on the beach. Like these are called beach hoppers, or little uh, am uh, amphipods. Yeah, no. yeah, I think they're amphipods. I forget now. Anyway, uh, but they'll eat a lot of little shrimps and, and flies and fly larvae and just about anything. We found that their diet is really varied. Uh, whatever it happens to be bouncing around on the beach, they can catch it. They'll eat it. And they do like uh, certain places. The, the little. Uh, beach hopper things that burrow into the sand. We found places where, uh, I don't know what it is, but the, the, the habitat is good. And you can walk along in late fall, late, late July, early August, and you have to, you know, you're stepping on hundreds of them as you walk, because there's just billions of them in the sand. And uh, it'll only be one little patch. Yeah. Well, there, there are various places up and down the beaches, you know, up and down the coast. This particular one I'm talking about is at Clan Beach. Uh, uh, north of uh, Arcata, up on the Humboldt coast, but it's true everywhere. And there's a lady. Um, we 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 walked yesterday on the beach. There were just those patches, just like you said. Yeah. It was like soup. Yeah, it's really pretty impressive. Really cool. And uh, there's a lady down at uh, Scripps has been studying this and find out, you know, what what is the part? Why are we? Why is one part of the beach better than other parts? And it turns out that a really big reason is where all the kelp comes ashore, where all the seaweed comes apart. Because as that seaweed rots, it's, it's causing a lot, of, it's introducing a lot of organic material. And so where you find seaweed on beaches are productive beaches. And 
I know down here, people rake all the seaweed off the beaches in big places, you know, and, and they're, they're not very productive anymore. But you find places like this, and, and, and they're patchy, you know. So the Clam Beach is one that's about, it's about 300 yards long of about a two-mile long beach. And we have watched, uh, when the snowy plovers, that's a male there, well, this is the pink lady. I'm not going to get into this story because it takes too long, but she's famous. I got to tell you. Sorry. I'm going to get into it. The, the, uh, um, a nest in Half Moon Bay one year had uh, three eggs, like they always, they almost always had three eggs. And the red tailed hawk came and ate them all. And so the docents down there got the eggs, took them to um, the Monterey Bay Aquarium where they raised them. And then they banned them and they let them go. And uh, at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, they let him go. And the very first sighting of any of them was this lady, the pink lady. And we found out it was a lady later, because I'll tell you that. And she turned out that she was seen at the site where her eggs, where she was inside the egg. Of course, she had not seen outside. That was pretty cool. And she would go back there. Then she moved up to Mendocino County and invested two years up in our area. And uh, a lady uh, named uh, Becky Bowen, who uh, heads up a program we have called Save Our Shorebirds, uh, she wrote a kid's book with kids' pictures about this, and it's just real fun. <laughs> anyway, uh, here's a, a chick, I mean, a, on a nest, and, and these little blurry lines here are actually cages that we used to put around the nest to keep the ravens from coming in and eating the chicks. And uh, this worked for about five years and then six years, actually almost eight years we did this, and then the great horned owls figured out there were meals inside there, we had to quit doing it. But in other places where they've done that, it's usually lasted three or four years before they had to quit. So we got a lot of plovers out of those uh, cages. There's a plover sitting on the eggs down there. And then, you know, they end up, there's the eggs. And uh, when they catch, the interesting thing about snowy plovers is that the females do almost all the incubating. And when they're done incubating and they hatch, that's the end of their job. They take off, they go find another guy and start over again. Yeah. And the guy has to take care of the chicks. And we have watched a male with three chicks walk in, uh, these guys get up, this one's hatching, this one I haven't quite hatched, I was there that was banding these chicks because we monitor all these things. And uh, when they got up and started walking off, I don't have a picture of the chicks walk, walking, but uh, they will get up and start walking within a couple of hours of the time they're hatched. And they'll leave the nest so they don't have any to do the nest. And we've watched a male take the chicks a mile and a half north to that spot on the beach that all that really cool stuff. Uh, you know, so those are important places for them. Anyway, there's a snowy plover. And we're seeing really good response to snowy plovers up and down the coast. Unfortunately, our area, Recovery Unit 2, Mendocino, Sonoma, or excuse me, Mendocino, Humboldt, and Del Norte County, we're still struggling with a lot of beach grass and a lot of ravens. But up in Oregon and Washington, and down in Monterey Bay area, San Juan Reyes, they're seeing some really good uh, recovery, and we're actually hoping someday to get this species off the endangered list. They're getting to be more numerous things. <laughs> oh, I got to talk about the spotted owl. Yeah, I can't get around with that. Uh, this is kind of an icon, old growth forest, and uh, you know, some people say it tastes like chicken, and we got to get rid of it. But uh, you know, this one, this bird probably has played a more important role in uh, recovering our forest than anything else. Because uh, I know my first job as a consultant was walking in front of the bulldozer and waving my hands that they were going to push down a tree that had a spotted owl. Now, of course, uh, there's a lot more that gets done. And uh, even though a lot of the timber companies complain for many years, and some of them up in Oregon and Washington are still complaining, here in California, we're seeing an incredible uh, response and really good, uh, good management for these things. Um, and there's just some shots of spotted owls, uh, of a spotted owl, those from a nice log. Beautiful dark eyes and so on. So uh, anyway, uh, <clears throat> the, the culprit now with a lot of what uh, the spotted owl stuff is, is unfortunate, is the barred owl. The barred owl is the eastern counterpart to the spotted owl. And for some reason or another, they've invaded across the northern part of the uh, hemisphere through Canada and started coming down the Pacific coast. And you have them here in the Los Angeles County area now. They were, I saw the second one ever in California back in the 80s, and now they're all over. And they eat spotted owls. And they kick spotted owls out of their territory. 
And we don't know, there's a lot of, I mean, there are people up in Washington who have promoted the idea of killing spotted barred owls to keep the spotted owls alive. And we really don't know what's going on. My own feeling is I think this is a natural thing that's gone on, and it's going to be difficult for us to deal with it because, um, but I think the biggest issue is the spotted owl is adapted to large expanses of almost perfect old growth forest. And if you divide it up into little patches, that's perfect for the barred owl. But we've done that, dividing it up into little patches. We have also found the spotted owl does really well in patchy forests, but only if the barred owl is not there. Because barred owls are better at patchy forests than spotted owls are. So, uh, you know, we'll have to see what's happening. It's going to be an interesting thing to watch, whether this is something we can actually solve the problem and keep spotted owls here, or whether barred owls will eventually take over all the way. Are they that much bigger? They're, they're, they're about that much bigger. They're not that, I mean, a spot is about this big and a barred is about that big. But, but uh, a friend of mine found a barred owl eating a spotted owl And they use breed? Uh, they are, there are some hybrids, yeah, barred and spotted owls, and they're actually called spotted owls. Uh, <laughs> what about, I remember hearing that hybridization is also a problem. It is a little bit, but it's pretty rare. That's it, yeah, they do hybridize sometimes. And, and I remember one time it was about, doing a, an owl survey and I I heard, that's not a spotted owl, that's not a barred owl, that's like halfway between and some foresters later on found a hybrid right there where I heard that, so sparred owl is what we call it. Um, it's pretty rare, it has happened and we don't think it's going to be a real big problem, but it could change as time goes on. Anyway. Here's a, another owl that needs some protection, getting, getting a lot of protection. Now, this is the great gray owl that lives up in Yosemite and a couple other spots in, uh, in the, the Sierras. And then it's found further north. The interesting thing is we've done genetic analysis, and our great gray owls are probably different from all the other great gray owls in the world. So we have to take care of them. You know, these are special. And uh, Yosemite is a great place to go see them in areas around them. They, they live in high meadows, eat gophers, and uh, hunt in the daytime, so they're real fun. The burrowing owl is a, is a bird that uh, used to uh, live in old, um, well, lives in old uh, ground squirrel holes uh, throughout the part of the central, the southern part of the central valley. In fact, throughout the entire central valley, they're very common. And other parts, uh, down here, in, into the uh, deserts even. Um, but they were heavily impacted by farmers because the farmers didn't like the ground squirrels and would get rid of all the ground squirrels and there would be no burrows and then they would also clean up everything others also. Burrowing owl is actually a faint listed species right now in California. But we are seeing a return of them. Now this is a bird that wintered on our coast this summer, and, uh, or this winter. And if you lived up in the Fort Bragg area and you were a bird watcher, this is probably the most famous bird on our coast. Everybody would go out to see that. <laughs> yeah, Jim, you, Jim got great pictures of when he was visiting me. My brother in uh, Anyway, uh, we are now, there's a lot of management going on. And uh, when Charlene and I drove down from Pinnacles National Monument to come down for the show this weekend, I, there was about a, I don't know, probably 50 miles where all we saw were ground squirrels. Uh, the more ground squirrels that I've seen in the rest of my life combined with So we kept hoping that that's going to be good for the burrowing owls. Speaking of burrows and places to, to to nest. Uh, the northern flicker, most of you know this, is a woodpecker, and it's not a danger. It's, there's lots of them around, and it's a very neat looking bird. Sight is very beautiful. It has a real, whoops, no, it's one of you uh, Really beautiful, you know, high pitched beep, you know, that everybody gets to hear. And the most important thing about flickers from a bird point of view is that they will build a nest and use it for one year, then they won't use it again. They build a new nest next year. So every year they build a new nest. And so all these old nests are hanging around, guess who gets to use them? Well, screech owls. Yeah, that's where this baby comes from, an old flicker nest. And, um, you know, saw owls. Where do they make a nest? They wouldn't find trees and not high up. The good thing about flickers is they're very variable. They use a lot of different trees, and they'll, they, they usually like to stay like above eight feet, eight feet and on up. And what they do, how they find out to make a nest, is they go knocking around. And they're not going to somebody go knock something down. But that sounds hollow. That must be a little bit of rotten wood. It'd be easy for us to make a hole into. 
and then they'll peck into there. They find the rotten wood inside. So it's usually old snags. So dead trees are good for woodpeckers, and because they're good for woodpeckers, they're also good for owls and a whole bunch of other things. The flickers really are an important component of our bird world because they make homes for a lot of other things. Purple martins nest in old flicker uh, things. Tree swallows. Uh, yeah, beautiful. Here's a tree swallow going into an old flicker hole. Um, violet green swallows, although they like a little bit smaller, so they'll use hairy woodpeckers sometimes, you know. And um, yeah, so cool stuff. Or you can put your own boxes up here. <laughs> but I like some woodpeckers make their holes too. So anyway, oh. How many of you guys saw that joke that Audubon said out the other day? Have we ever been introduced? No. <laughs> For those of you who know it, that's a European starling and European house were both introduced to. <laughs> that's pretty funny when they were looking at each other. Have we been introduced? Yeah, you've been introduced here. And uh, you know, the house sparrows were introduced to pick out the seeds from the horse poop in the streets of New York so that the, the streets of New York wouldn't get grass growing on it. Went back in the days when, you know, before it was paid. And then the starling was introduced in Central Park because there was somebody who thought that uh, all the birds in Shakespeare's plays should be in Central Park where we always do Shakespeare's plays. So he was 20 or 20 pair. And we're, you know, the, the, the day is not really good. And now there's millions, maybe even billions of starlings across the United States. And they like old woodpecker holes too. They will actually kick other birds out of the old woodpecker holes, including things like kestrels. When you think a starling is kicking a hawk out of them, that's, that's a tough guy. So, um, so that is an issue. There was a, a, a movement a few years ago to uh, starling free in 2003. And uh, it didn't work. Okay, we're going to have to live with them for a long time. But uh, western bluebirds are another thing. And they, they, they were uh, pretty heavily impacted by starlings when starlings was in here. And so now there's been a lot of work in putting up western bluebird boxes. Uh, throughout the western United States and, and very successfully finding places for them to nest. Uh, <clears throat> another you know, little story, of course, is the riparian habitats. For those of you who don't know the word riparian, that's plants that grow along the river, you know, like willows and cottonwoods and things like that. And back when uh, you know, the white man first came to California, in fact, throughout the United States, uh, we cut right up to the rivers, you know, and cut all the riparian habitats because being next to water was a good place for agricultural stuff, you know, it made sense. And so a lot of riparian birds declined dramatically. The yellow warbler was one of them. Uh, PRBO is a really good partner, Birds Observatory is a really good group that's doing a lot of work right now in the Central Valley of California to protect and restore a lot of riparian habitats and bring, you know, the yellow warbler. Here's one looking at you back. Um, one of the issues that came with the yellow warbler wasn't so much that it did run out of some habitat, but it, we also made an excellent habitat for the brown-headed cowbird that loves to live in the open fields and lays its eggs in the warbler nest and the feral nest and the burial nest. And, um, and Dick Ayers is not here, but he reminded me that I have to tell about the Bell Stereo here in Southern California that he worked on. He's, he's a local consultant here. Um, but. Uh, one of the big things, that, and, and, and the Kirtland's warbler, a whole bunch of species were really threatened with extinction by the fact that brown headed cowards had perfect habitat. In the Kirtland's warbler area, they actually trapped and killed most of the brown headed cowards in the area, and the Kirtland warbler were coming back pretty strongly. In our area, we're not killing brown headed cowards, but we're restoring more of the riparian habitat so the cowards don't go as far into the habitat, they stay out in the, in the agricultural areas. And so I was growing the habitat. I mean, that's the lady. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that bird, but she lays her eggs in someone else's nest. Yeah. And the willow flycatcher, this is a, a bird that nests in uh, little willow patches up in the mountains. It's pretty heavily impacted by the brown headed cowboy, too. And because we're protecting the willows in the Sierras now, and the willows are and in southern Arizona and so on. The willows are, are getting bigger, and we're seeing less of an impact on the cat from the cat bird. And lots of other species along our riparian, like the grove speaks, and uh, you know, are benefiting. In the Central Valley, a few years ago, we had a pretty bad hit uh, of the yellow-billed magpie, which found only in California, with West Nile virus. And magpies almost disappeared from the Central Valley, and there wasn't much we could do about it. 
because we didn't know how to stop West Nile virus, but luckily there were a few of them that were resistant enough that came. So we're seeing yellow bill magpies come back in the valley now, but their numbers are still fairly low. Crows and ravens, yeah, well, they're a problem for us. I love them. They're brilliant animals. They're so cool, but don't feed them, okay? We got way too many of them, and they cause more problems for endangered species than almost anything else besides habitat. Uh, so here's some I mean, eating those seals on the beach here, and there's one eating a house finch. And uh, like I said, they get a lot of, they, of course, the big story with the California quail uh, is cats. You know, feral cats are a huge issue now. If you have a cat, keep it indoors. I know it's something you want. One of my best friends, Patrick, told me the other day, said, Ron, you and I disagree on that. They got cats all over the house. And they don't have very many birds. I mean, all over their yard, not their house. So, uh, but there are places like this jetty, in, uh, this is a jetty uh, on, in Crescent City, um, and this is out on Catalina Island, you know, where uh, there are feral cats. And we watched this one actually go after some birds. Day we were out there. And the quail populations, you find California quail where there are not outdoor cats. I mean, you'll find some of them around a little bit, but not much. You're really outdoor cats, your quail populations will come back if they're there. I need to show this to Southern California, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> These guys like uh, riparian habitat too. <laughs> By the way, the woodpeckers, they're like flickers, they build big, uh, big holes in the trees, and uh, you know, because they need big trees that are dying, you know, and because we cut out a lot of old big trees, now we're running, now we're getting some big trees back, especially the cottonwoods and, and uh, more fast-growing trees than redwood trees. And so we're seeing places where by the woodpeckers are now starting, their numbers are starting to come back. And that's a good thing because birds like hooded mergansers, common mergansers, and wood ducks nest in pileated woodpeckers. Again, a bird that provides homes for other, which is really cool. So, uh, and just a real quick waterfowl. Um, I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to have to go a little faster. Uh, waterfowl, uh, you know, back in the old days, we covered up all the marshes and got rid of stuff and really, really hurt waterfowl. But we're seeing a real response now as we're restoring marshes all over the, the world. And it's one of the greatest things, you know, Central Valley, Bols Chica. I mean, you're protecting these marshes and restoring them. Uh, we just watched the show the other day in Iraq where they were restoring these great marshes and bringing uh, water back and, and uh, waterfowl are coming back. Uh, I mean, ducks are beautiful. We gotta have them around, you know? Um, and uh, one of the best stories here locally uh, in Southern California now is what's happened at Owens Lake, you know? Um, they required LA Water to uh, cover part of the lake uh, with water to keep the dust from blowing because the dust has toxic stuff in it that went downwind to Arizona and New Mexico and caused a lot of health problems for people. So they couldn't figure out how else to cover up the lake. So they just let a little bit of water and covered up the lake with water. In the first year, millions of birds showed up. Millions of birds showed up. And now, uh, Mike Prather, his Facebook name is Owens Lake, and if you know Mike Prather, he's doing wonderful stuff over there. And he's working hard to keep uh, ones like water. And there's just tremendous stuff. They did the, 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 the bird survey that this last week. I haven't heard the numbers, but uh, there's going to be a lot of them. Yes? Um, the toxic uh, particles that are in the air, when the, when the dust blows around in the lake, it, uh, obviously doesn't affect the birds then? Or well, it knows. Once the water is over there, it's not, it's not in the dust. It's stuff that, if you inhale it, it's bad for you. If it's on your skin, it doesn't hurt you. It's a matter of when you get it inside your lungs. It it yeah, it doesn't. It goes through your gut. It doesn't hurt you. But if you get it in your lungs, that's bad news. So the, it was the dust that was the big, biggest issue. Mud's not a problem for them. The sandpipers love that mud. What was the dust coming from on Owens Lake? Where was that? Well, it was just a dry lake bed because the Owens Lake used to be a lake decades ago. You know, 100 years ago, before LA took all the water, just like you know, Mono Lake. And so now there's a lot of issues about you know where water's coming from. And I think that's going to be an issue we're going to be dealing with for the rest of our lives and the rest of our kids' lives. Um, anyway, lots of ducks are coming back now. The pintail is one that used to require huge expanses of wintering ground. In fact, we had a big protest when they built the Sacramento Airport because they built it right in the middle of one of the largest pintail wintering areas in California. And uh, so now we've had to restore other places, but you know, it's coming back. 
and gag balls and shovelers and eh, I like bugs and they're beautiful. The Aleutian Canada goose, or actually now called the Aleutian cackling goose, is a bird that winters in the southern part of the Central Valley, like the Merced area, and nests in the Aleutian Islands. It stops in Humboldt and Del Norte County in southern Oregon to feed on the way north. They have to feed a lot because when they leave Humboldt, Del Norte County, they fly all the way to the Aleutians, one nonstop. When they get there, there's no food for them. Why do they go there when there's no food? Because they're timing it so that when the chicks hatch, there'll be lots of food. And it's not a long season, so they have to time it just perfectly for the chicks. So they have to have enough fat to fly all the way up there. Mom's got to build and get eggs. And then Papa and Mama have to have enough energy to incubate for a month. And then there's food for everybody. So it's the part up there. So you know, they, were, they were down to uh, literally a couple thousand birds, maybe a thousand birds. And uh, they got protected up in the Humboldt Bay and Del Norte County area. Um, thanks to a guy named Paul Springer, did a lot of really good work. He's passed on, but they, they, there was just a really nice tribute to him uh, last month on the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, webpage. Um, and he got them recovered to the point where they're now problem. <laughs> There's so many of them. <laughs> and so uh, the Aleutian goose, Aleutian cacti goose, is the only formerly endangered species I've ever eaten. Because you can now hunt them. We actually arranged, I was on the, the uh, not the recovery team, but on the management team after they got so many of them that the local farmers, they didn't want them there anymore because they can. We had one farmer who was a really good guy who didn't mind to have them on his land, but he documented $50,000 a year lost to the geese just raising his cattle grazing gas. And so, uh, so we've been working with them now, and there's lots of uh, public lands. And so, what we do, we have a special hunt that's late in the season that allows the hunters to move to chase the geese off private lands, but they can't hunt on public lands, so they go and eat on the public lands and they get all the food they need. And, well, some of the hunters get a little food too. <laughs> anyway, there's the cat and the geese. Uh, they, you can see what they look like in the fields up there and uh, how they're competing with the cows. Oh, I'm going to skip this one. This is a lace on teal from, uh, from Hawaii being reintroduced to Midway Island and going very, very well right now. Uh, actually, actually, it's being introduced to Midway. It never was found on Midway. They couldn't get enough habitat on Laysan Island to recover the species, so they moved it over to Midway, and it's doing very, very well. In fact, I think, yeah, this is the only endangered species I've ever photographed from my bathroom window. This is like in my room at Midway Island this year, when I was there, or last year. And the geese, the geese are doing really good. In fact, the snow geese have got to the point where there is a campaign in the northeastern part of the North America to reduce numbers of snow geese because they are causing, uh, what people are claiming, a lot of damage to the tundra. Uh, they trump over the tundra and other species can't get there. Now, part of it's that, part of it's global climate change, so it's hard to you know, tease out what the real issues are. And the Ross's goose are smaller goose that nests up in the northeastern part of the North American continent and winters in our central valley. One of the very few birds that goes from the northeast to the southwest. Most of the rest of the birds go from the northwest to southeast. But these are fun. And uh, here we got a bunch of them coming in. And yeah, they're doing well. And bald eagles love to see them. And they don't like to see bald eagles. That's what happens when a bald eagle flies over. <laughs> Pretty cool. Anyway, and because we saved a lot of, uh, of marsh birds like the waterfowl, a lot of other birds like the common yellowfoot, the marsh wrens, uh, short-eared owls, American bitterns, uh, sora, I mean Virginia rails, sora rails. You, you restore marsh, you bring back a lot of stuff. It's really cool. White uh, faced ibis. Um, when I was a kid, young birding, they were gone from the Central Valley. We never saw them. Um, I, I, I think I probably went 10 years before I saw one in the Central Valley. You'd have to go to northeastern California to see one. And now, oh, I, messed, I left that picture out, but I've been in Sacramento National Wildlife Refuge and seen thousands of them swimming, flying by in the sunset. And we see them all the time now. It's a really good good thing. And it's because of the restoration of the marshes. Sand Hill Greens have, have uh, benefited from that. And uh, shorebirds benefit from us taking care of marshes. Uh, mostly on the coast, but in the inland too. And there's a whole bunch of, I'm going through these real quickly because I'm coming up to my hour. I try not to talk more than an hour. 
But anyway, lots of shorebirds are benefiting now from uh, protection of, shore, of uh, shorebird habitat along the coast, mostly uh, estuarine habitat. Windrills here and barren sandpiper and barley goblets. This is a great one because up in Humboldt Bay, where I uh, did a lot of my work, uh, the marble goblet there is probably different from the marble goblets that are down here. We found out that the, every there were, every spring when you'd be on the phone in the evening and you'd just swim a big flock of marble goblets come over, you'd have to stop because you couldn't hear it anymore, and they were going north. But they all nested inland. We didn't understand why they were going north because they all went to Kansas to nest and, and Missouri and places like that. Well, it turned out that the ones in Humboldt Bay are a different subspecies, and they nest in the center of Alaska, the place that nobody ever even knew that they were. So there's a separate subspecies that nest only in Humboldt Bay, so we want to take good care of Humboldt Bay and keep those guys going good. Marble Cow, the Grace Bird, and Long Little Curly. And uh, <clears throat> they spend a lot of time wintering in the Central Valley of California. There's some really good projects now with working with California Audubon to protect riparian habitats and, and also the, the wetland habitats, the agricultural wetlands, and the, the, they're doing good. Black neck stilts, um, if I were to read some of the stuff from William Leon Dawson's uh, writings, he thought they'd all be gone because of what we were doing to the wetlands of the southern part of California, and now they're doing very well. And it's really cool that we can say that proudly. And this one's dancing for joy. <laughs> and the yellow is big in a paint. <laughs> Sand rings along the beach. Uh, I don't know that we've had a big uh, a change in them, but I still like them. So, mm -hmm. oyster catchers. We just finished the first ever uh, statewide survey of black oyster catchers uh, last year with California Audubon. And in fact, we just uh, sent off our paper to get published. And we ended up finding uh, over 5,000. We thought we were going to be lucky to find 3,000. We found over 5,000, so we're real happy that black ice catchers are doing so well here. Um, we're a little concerned with them, though, because they eat mussels. They eat mussels on the low, flat tide stuff. And uh, with rising sea level, we're going to see a very big change in this. We don't know whether it's going to be a good change or a bad change. And so we've established some long-term monitoring of the black oyster catchers now and the reproduction um, in various stages up and down the coast. So here's a, a pair, mom on the nest, papa watching out on top, and there's mom with three chicks. They hatch three, they hatch two or three chicks, little guys, and they leave the nest immediately, just like the snowy plumbers, and uh, they hide. How many of you can see the chick? You can't see the chick? You won't even believe me when I tell you, but right there is a the chick. There's his head. And that's his body right there. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, I monitor these guys. I monitor about 16 nests a year. It's not easy to find those chicks. It's a real challenge. Uh, and then uh, here's some as they get older. They follow the mom and dad around. They, they have territories. They establish very, very tight territories. Uh, I call it, instead of lines in the sand, it's lines in the rocks. And uh, you can watch every day the oyster catchers come up and scream at each other and scream at each other and they come right up to that line they won't cross it. They won't cross it. And then they go back and the next day they scream at each other at the same <laughs> line. They do that and they've been I'm following two pairs that have done that for about five years now. And uh, they don't go across that line. And the chicks don't cross that line either. So it's really cool to have that. And we're seeing, uh, uh, we're having fun with that. Here's the chick, see the, that's about ready to fledge, see the dark tip. And not as bright a color and a little spotting. So, and they keep that dark tip for about uh, almost a year. So you can tell the young ones from the adults. Other species along the shore, rocky shore, on wandering tapas or bird black turnstones, uh, fun to have. Modern birds come down here. Most people don't think much of gulls. But since I did my thesis on them, I'm into gulls. And the western gull is something we have to pay attention to because the western gull nests from like southern Oregon to Baja. It's the only place in the world it is. Now, they're a common, they're not going extinct, they're not endangered. In fact, they might even be causing problems, but let's pay attention because there are a okay? <laughs> Caspian terns. The Caspian terns used to nest from, you know, Alaska all the way down to uh, Baja. And there was a period of time for about 15 years where all of the Caspian terns on the west coast nested on one island in the Columbia River at the mouth of the Columbia River. They loved that spot because there was so much, uh, I'll walk back over here, but, uh, they loved that spot because there was uh, a lot of baby salmon coming down. And everybody says, oh, they're eating all the baby salmon. You know, we can't, we're gonna, all our baby salmon are gonna, they're gonna stink. Well, it turned out they ate all 
the the hatchery salmon because the wild salmon swam deep. Oh, hatchery salmon oh, swam the surface because that's where you fed them. And so, so they but they have moved that colony out to another site down down river further, and uh, and they're also uh, you know re uh, reestablishing colonies and from San Francisco all the way up to Alaska they're nesting. So we're going to see more Caspian there. Seabirds, you know, there are lots of stories about the seabirds, the cormorants, the pelagic cormorant. That was the branch cormorant, the blue, and the pelagic cormorant. So one of the projects I'm working on right now, right now, is to study the pelagic cormorants because these birds nest in real small groups on the side of cliffs like this. And uh, the big colonies, like out on the Faroe Islands or up in Oregon, there's one. Um, they've declined dramatically. And everybody thought, oh my gosh, black cormorants, what's going on? So we started studying little colonies up and down the coast, and we got so confused you wouldn't believe it. This colony would do really great this year, then it would be gone the next year, another colony would do great that year. And you know, so now we're realizing that the only way we're going to see if we can really monitor black cormorants is to have people up and down the coast from Baja all the way up to Washington monitor a whole bunch of little colonies, pool all the data, and then we'll see what's going on with them. So we're finished, we're just our fifth year doing the work. I'll be doing a paper next year on, uh, on our results. And these are birds like the pelagic cormorant and the pigeon guillemot that, net, that feed on fish that live on or near the bottom right along the shoreline. And so very little is known about those kind of fish and what their populations are. Like that red thing. <laughs> and when the chicks hatch, the interesting thing about the pelagic, the uh, um, the pigeon guillemot, this is a chick that's just hatched. They come out of the burrow for the first time. They'll sit on the water in the ocean near their burrow, uh, near their nesting island, for a day, and then they disappear. And when I say they disappear, you know, you think we know all about birds now. We still don't know where pigeon guillemots go in the wintertime. As a species, we don't know where they go. They leave Alaska, they leave Oregon and Washington and California. And there's some indication that they probably all go up into the inland passage of British Columbia, and that's where they spend their winters. But we have not proven that. We have not found concentrations in numbers that would total up all the ones that are gone. So we still have things to learn about these birds. <laughs> and the common birds. Yeah, eggs of common birds. They used to be, I guess they're really good to eat. There were 14 million eggs taken off the Farallon Islands in about 25 years during the gold rush. Because people didn't, they were so anxious to come out here and get gold, they left their chickens at home. Oh, and so it made a really big deal. In fact, Captain Scammon, Scammon's Lagoon, the guy who you know, discovered the gray whales down there, when he was a lieutenant, he was assigned to the Farallon Islands to settle the egg wars because there were wars about who was getting everything the eggs. And the bad thing is they took 14 million eggs off, but the day before they took those eggs off, and of course they did this over a number of years, they went out and broke every egg to make sure that tomorrow's eggs were fresh. So you can't even imagine how many eggs were killed, how many eggs were broken out there. And then of course the MERS, um, yeah, beautiful eggs too. Uh, MERS had some troubles with oil spill and gill net fishing and so on like that. But we're really coming back. The common MERS on the Farallons and other places, we're seeing them uh, invade new areas and, and nesting in places that we haven't seen them nest in 50 years now. So it's a, it's a good story what's going on. Here they are coming, bringing in fish to feed their chicks. They like anchovies. Chicks get big. I won't go into that story all the way. Oil is an issue. Here's a rescue breed with oil on it. It's very common throughout. The, it's, it's a constant issue. That just not big oil spills are a big problem, but there is a little problem all the time with continuing oil. It's very rare for me to go to San Francisco Bay and not see a western breed with oil on its belly. And it's probably the same down here in places, you know. So something we want to continue to work on. This is not oil. This is a reflection of beautiful cliffs off Point Marina. I like them. nice clean western green surfery. <laughs> Ravens, we already talked about them. There's one carrying a murray away. Yeah, they can be a problem to a lot of things. The introduced species are really an issue. This is a rhinoceros aqua nesting on the Farallon Islands. Uh, back when I went out there in 1968, when we first started our work out there, uh, there were rabbits all over the island. And these were European rabbits, introduced rabbits that the lighthouse keepers used to use you know, to, for food. And when the lighthouse keepers left, the rabbits went crazy. And uh, there was a big issue about whether we should take the rabbits out or not. 
Um, and um, there was one guy, I'm, I, it was one of my first ever days at Mark Grace Bird Observatory, and uh, as a com conversation going on with this guy who studied the genetics of the rabbits on the Farallots, and he was looking at a long-term project he didn't want to go. And then there was, you know, someone who said, well, we've got to get rid of them because we can bring the plants back. Because the plants are all gone, and a lot of the native plants. Oh yeah, and the rhinoceros lockwoods too, because there are only uh, you know, 10 or 20 pair there then, when there used to be hundreds, thousands of pairs. And uh, so, it, and it was a really, I was, it was one of my first days listening to an argument like that. And uh, I was very impressed by all these scientists, and they were trading information, and not getting mad at each other, just learning from each other. And in the long run, we ended up getting rid of the rabbits on the Farallons, and now there's about uh, 6,000 rhinoceros lockwoods nesting on the Farallons. And uh, now the big uh, project for the Farallons is to get rid of the mice um, out there because they're affecting the storm petrels, which I'm not going to show pictures of now. But, um, we're hoping to get them. Well, I will show the storm petrel picture pretty soon. I'll tell you about that. The Cassidy's Oculus, um, they've been impacted on the Farallons because the rhinoceros oculus came back and took over a bunch of the places where Cassidy's oculus used to nest. But we got rid of the rats on Anacap Island. We get rid of the rats on uh, some of the other islands now, and the gas and are coming back down here. So the introduced animals on islands have been a real problem, and, and, and we're finding solutions to them, and it's really good stories going on. <coughs> oh, I just had to show that picture of Puffin because I was there. <laughs> uh, here's one. This is a, a bird called the Bonham Petrel on uh, Midway Island. When I went there in 2001, and there were 20 common, maybe 200 common petrels to go see one, you had to go to one little corner of the island that was far away from every place else and sneak over there at night and listen carefully and watch, be real careful, and you might see one, you might see two. Um, now, when we walk out of the, of the uh, house or the barracks and walk around, you have to duck because they're flying around at night all over the place. They got rid of the rats, and the bone and petrels came back. They quit uh, weed whacking around the albatross nests, and so the lawns are now riddled with burrows. They let them go back to where they belong, not leaving golf places for the military people. And now there's one and petrels nesting all over the island. It was a very exciting thing to see in the 11 year period, you know, 12 year period of changes. Okay, there's, that's Jeff Candace and Dodger for you Southern California folks. Uh, but that's an ashy storm petrel that I came to park in San Francisco. And the uh, storm petrels nest out on the Farallons. And this is a juvenile who's just hatched and looking for where he's supposed to be. No one ever sees them in San Francisco Bay. But about every other year at Giants games in August, we see them come in and fly around in the lights. They get up in the lights. Now, we've not just, uh, we've looked at this pretty carefully. We don't think this is a big problem. But over in Hawaii, this is the Hawaiian petrel. Many of you probably have heard about this. The Hawaiian petrels, when they fledge, and the noodle shearwater and other species that nest in the islands of Hawaii, they come down to the ballparks and to the football fields and to the lights in town because they're attracted to the lights. They don't know what to do. And so now they have restructured a whole bunch of the lighting in Hawaii throughout the, all the islands, in fact, Kauai, Big Island stuff. And we're seeing more of these guys fledge now, and that's just a really great thing. Yeah. Birds come from, I'm almost done. Got one more good story. We got birds coming from all over that come here. They don't nest here. Sooty shearwater, pink footed shearwater, fuller shearwater, flesh footed shearwater. These guys nest in the southern hemisphere Australia, New Zealand, South America, and they come up and spend the time here. Black footed albatross nests over in Hawaii, over in, Australia, in Japan, but they come here to, to uh, feed in the, in the winter time. And actually, They'll come here during the breeding season. Um, okay, I've got them backwards. Let me go through this real quick. Yeah, there's one. That's a banded bird from uh, one of the islands over in, and, and they've now put radio transmitters on and shown that an albatross, while it's feeding chick over in Midway or Laysan or Johnston Atoll, will leave the island, fly to California, feed, fly back and feed the chick. It's about a seven day trip. So, so our, our oceans are important to this bird's way over there. And uh, so uh, the biggest issue with albatross is now is long line fishermen, and they, uh, where there's, they, get, they throw the baited hook over, and the albatross grabs the bait, gets caught in the hook and grounds. Um, and there's lots of problems, but this is actually getting fixed really good here in the Northern Pacific. Uh, throughout the world, it's a problem, but it's being fixed a lot throughout the world. 
fishermen themselves have figured out ways to get the lines underwater and deep before the albatross can get them. And uh, some really good things are happening with the black-footed albatross. Uh, Laysan albatross is uh, a very special bird, uh, just because it's beautiful. It's because it's the you know numerous on the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, oh, they're just great birds, you know. Who's um, one feeding the chick? I gotta tell you about this one. This is wisdom. How many of you know what wisdom is? Uh, one person, two people, three who know who wisdom is. Wisdom is the oldest wild bird known in the world. She's banded, see? She was abandoned in 1956 by Chan Robinson. Chan's on two crutches now. He walks like this. He says, I wish I was as healthy as wisdom. <laughs> you know? and he works in the banding lab. He's a great guy. And he banded her as an adult in 1956, which means she was at least five years old then. She couldn't get to 10, 15 for all we know. So she is at a minimum of 62 and a half years old now. And uh, this was her chick last year. She's got a chick this year. She's raising a chick this year. <laughs> which is pretty darn cool, you know? Uh, how many reproductively active animals in the world that are 60 years old? Maybe yeah. turtles, elephants, you know, not very many. So it's pretty cool that an albatross can do that. There might be older ones there on the island that just nobody banded. We don't know, you know? This is on Midway Island. Yeah. If you want to become a Facebook friend of Wisdom, you can. Uh, we don't know who does Wisdom's Facebook. And uh, I, I have. Well, actually, a former student of mine is the refuge manager at Midway now, uh, the assistant refuge manager. He, he does a lot of uh, NPR interviews about wisdom and stuff. And none of us know who does Wisdom's Facebook page, but she keeps you posted about what's going on. There. <laughs> so you can search for wisdom on Facebook and you become a friend of her. Anyway, it was a real thrill for me to see wisdom last year. I, I took this picture last year. Okay, last story, finishing up here, the short-tailed albatross. The short-tailed albatross is a bird that used to be really common along our coast. Uh, hundreds of them, thousands of them used to winter here. And then they were hunted to near extinction because the adults had big white feathers. Remember what I said about big white feathers? Most of the, there are pictures on an island of thousands of dead uh, short-tailed albatross adults being ready to ship off to London and Paris and New York and places like that. They were exterminated from almost all of their islands, mostly nest over in Japan. Uh, this was my first short-tailed albatross, and it was I was working at the Cal Academy one year, uh, doing some research stuff, and uh, I got a phone call, said, or I didn't get a phone call, the, the, the uh, curator of the birds and mammals got a phone call and said, we got a short-tailed albatross that landed on a Greek trawler. They fed it Greek cheese and sausage and brought it into them to put it in the zoo. So my friend Suzanne Luther and I, we went down, and there it is, the very first short-tailed albatross I ever saw. Probably about a three-year-old bird. Um, and this was, there were no California records since long ago at that time, so that was a very exciting thing. And uh, this guy, Hiroshi Hashigawa, and I do choke up a little bit when I tell the story, because he was a young kid helping out another researcher, and he went to an island. Well, let me, I should have to say that uh, when they destroyed most of them, there were a few little colonies left. And then during World War II, those colonies were wiped out because the Japanese built air bases on those colonies. The one place that they didn't wipe out was an island called Tarishima. And Tarishima, they didn't put an air base on there because it was an active volcano. And uh, the last known population of short-tailed albatrosses in the 40s was destroyed by the active volcano in the world. So it was thought to be extinct. And in late late 50s, Hiroshi and this other guy were out there investigating these reports of these big white birds on the hill at Tarishima and found 20 short-tailed albatrosses. And what probably happened was that during when they were all killed, it takes short-tailed albatrosses seven to ten years to come back to nest after they hatch. There were probably a few of them flying around the ocean somewhere that didn't get killed. And, and they came back and they started nesting again. So Hiroshi He's such a great guy. We got to be friends with him. He, he's the kind of guy that says, oh, I didn't do anything special. I just, I just did my job. That was my job. That's all I did. And he is the reason that the short-tailed albatross is alive. He is the reason there are 3,000 short-tailed albatrosses in our world right now. And uh, so 
Here's one that's nesting on Midway, or trying to nest. This one's not there, it's not nesting yet, but she's there on Midway right now. And we're finding about a dozen, maybe 15, short term albatrosses that are now nesting on Midway. What Hiroshi did was move them from this big uh, rock uh, lava flow where they were nesting. He moved a whole bunch of them over to another place. So there's two colonies on Kirishima now, one in a much safer place. And then when the US and Oregon, I mean, and Canada and Japan uh, all got together to work on this, they now have moved a bunch, they've raised a bunch of chicks from Kirishima and moved them over to, to another island that's, uh, that's where they used to nest. And um, they let them go on that island. And this year, the first ones came back, and actually, two of the young ones started courting. They're too young to nest yet, but they were five years later, they were courting with each other. So that's really thrilling stuff. And uh, so here it is a male short tailed albatross that we saw in 2001. Now, these are decoys, and that's a noise a, a recording device to make the noise. These are decoys here. Um, I didn't put it in the picture, but uh, some of you might know the, uh, the story of Steve Crest, who started using decoys toys to bring the puffins back to Maine. Well, I got a picture of Steve Crest with his arm around a short tailed albatross. <laughs> you know, they used his idea, and, they were, and it's working. So this, uh, this male here didn't have a, didn't have a chick, it didn't have a, a female um, the year we were there in 2001, that this one here was the female that was also there, but she was on the wrong island. There's two islands out of Midway. So the refugee man who took her, carried her over, introduced her to the male, <laughs> they went, whoa, and started bouncing, <laughs> and the female flew back and never said anything oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> So it went by, and then in 2011, he found a girl. She came naturally, and see this real black chick here that's bigger than most of the others? That's the second short-tailed albatross chick ever to be hatched in the United States. And that one fledged. The first one in 2011, this was 2012, last year, 2011, the first one, uh, there was a huge storm that washed the chick out of the nest. And albatross chicks, they have to be on the, at the nest where mom doesn't know who you are, my dad doesn't know who you are, doesn't know how to feed you. And it got washed off the nest, and so it's against the law for the refuge people to touch any endangered species. So what they had to do is they had to kind of herd them onto a cart and pull them back <laughs> over, and push them back onto the nest, and um, they started feeding the chick again. It got then the tsunami hit, and the same thing happened. It got washed off the nest, and destroyed that tsunami, and destroyed uh, over 100,000 black women and place high albatrosses uh, there. Fortunately, sure enough, chick was alive. Throw it back over, same thing, and it fledged. First fledged uh, short tailed albatross in the history of the United States. And then this is number two, and it also fledged last year. This year, mom and dad are taking the year off. They're not nesting this year because they don't nest every year. Anyway, there's the, the chick again. This is the this is a lace on albatross chick, and there's the short tail, bigger, blacker, and so on. So why, why is this important to you? Why am I telling you this story? You know, I mean, here's another young albatross that showed up at Midway. We were there for the young short tail. Um, you know, this is all happening over Japan and Midway and stuff. But these guys come back to the United States. Here was my first ever short tailed albatross flying off the coast of California. My lifelong dream, May two years ago, and it came in and landed behind the boat. This one was the one last year. We saw another one, another actually. And I watched, I think I blew up, yeah. This picture doesn't show up, but we were able to see the band. We were actually able to read the number of the band. Guess who put that band on? Hiroshi Hashiko. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was me, Susan, but I never get to go with it. <laughs> uh, so it's been back now. And uh, yeah, what, I guess the kind of question is, why am I still telling you this story? Why is it so important? Well, that kid over in Hawaii, over in Japan, Hiroshi Hashikawa, who's now retired pretty much, uh, he is helping to restore our ecosystem because there used to be thousands of church on trusses that wintered here that was a part of our thing. They would eat the dead whales and come into San Francisco Bay and I'm walking them back. So good bird conservation stories and uh, that's what I'm going to finish with tonight. So thank you very much. <laughs>